Welcome to A.T. Stewart and Sons Ministries. I'm your host, A.T. Stewart. I'm glad you've chosen to join us today as we look into the Word of God. So take your Bibles and let's hang out in God's Word for a few moments and see what God would say to us today. Verse 4 and 5 is a scene of heaven. John is allowed to look into the very portals of heaven and to see heavenly things. And he's recounting for us what he had seen. And the throne there is the throne of God. And he sees a sealed scroll held in the hand of God, sealed with seven seals. And at first, no one is found worthy to open the scroll. Now, what is the meaning of the scroll? It is imperative that we understand the meaning of this scroll if we're going to understand this chapter. I believe this scroll held in the hand of God is a wheel. It was a common appearance of a wheel in John's day. Emperor Vespasian and Caesar Augustus both had wheels, which were scrolls sealed with seven seals. But this scroll in the hand of God is more than just an ordinary will. It is the will of mankind's forfeited inheritance. Now let's go back to the Old Testament Jewish law for a moment to understand. In the Old Testament days, a Jewish family was given a certain amount of land when Canaan was divided. You remember when they went in and took over the land of Canaan? And each of the tribes was allotted a certain section of Canaan. Well, within those tribes, the families were allotted a certain portion of land. That was their inheritance. It could be bought, it could be sold, it might even be lost because of poverty or something else. But the nation of Israel had an interesting phenomenon. It was called the year of Jubilee. That happened once every 50 years. And on this year of Jubilee, all the land went back to its original families, its original owners. So let's pretend that uh, we're living in those days in Israel. And I want to buy some land from uh, Mike Grzowski. And so I go to Mike and I say, Mike, I want to buy this portion of land from yours. Now we got about five years before the year of Jubilee comes. Well, I know when the year of Jubilee comes, I got, I'm going to lose that land. It's going to go back to Mike and his family. So I would pay him accordingly to the use of the land that I would get for the next five years. And between those 50 years, a family might lose part or all of its land due to distress, poverty, or whatever. Now, their losses were listed on a scroll, the land that they lost. It was sealed with seven seals. And on the outside of the scroll was written the conditions necessary to redeem that land, for that land to be purchased back. And not just anyone could purchase the land back. Say if Mike died, not just anyone could come to me and purchase that land back, say if it were somewhere in between the 50 years and they wanted the land back. It had to be a person who was qualified. It had to be a kinsman, first of all, a relative, but not just any relative. It had to be one that could meet the conditions written on the outside of the scroll. This person in Jewish history was known as the kinsman redeemer. You remember from the book of Ruth that Boaz was just such a kinsman redeemer for Naomi. Well, this scroll that John sees in the hand of God is the will of mankind's inheritance that he has forfeited, that he has lost. You see, when God created man, he gave him an inheritance. It can basically be divided into three things. He gave him eternal life. He walked with God in the Garden of Eden. He had communion and fellowship with God. Secondly, God gave him physical life. Adam and Eve would have lived forever. As God breathed into them the breath of life, and the scripture says they became living souls. Thirdly, God gave as an inheritance to man the world. God placed Adam and Eve on the earth and said, you are to subdue this world, you are to rule this world, you are to be fruitful and to multiply. I've placed you here to rule as my co-regents 
over this earth. So mankind's inheritance, eternal life, physical life, and the world. But an awful thing happened when Adam sinned. When Adam sinned, he forfeited this inheritance for all of mankind. As the head of the human race, as the federal head, the representative of all mankind, when he sinned, he forfeited our inheritance for us. So what do we see? We see eternal life was lost. They were thrown out of the garden. They could no longer have that close communion and fellowship with God. Physical life was lost. God said, it's the day you eat of that fruit, you will surely die. And the day they ate of it, they began to die, to age. And thirdly, they lost their dominion over the world. Thorns and weeds began to grow. The animals suddenly became wild and ferocious and they lost their dominion over the world. And even the world, the scripture says, even this planet earth suffers because of man's sin. Now that's bad enough that we would lose our inheritance. But to make matters even worse, when man lost his inheritance, there was another called Satan that came up and usurped it and claimed it for himself. So what we see now is that when man is born into this human race, he is born spiritually dead. He is born in the domain of darkness. He is born in bondage to Satan. Secondly, we see that in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve had sinned, that Satan's ultimate weapon was physical death. And he held that over mankind for thousands of years. And we see Satan also now controls the world systems. He is even referred to in Scripture as a prince of the power of the air, as the ruler of this world. So what we have in Genesis chapter 3 is we have mankind without his rightful inheritance. He has lost it because of sin, and we have Satan now claiming man's inheritance. And mankind and the world standing in need of someone who can redeem our lost inheritance. Someone who can be our kinsman redeemer. Someone who can repossess our inheritance for us. Someone who can meet the requirements listed on our forfeited inheritance. Someone who can regain for us eternal life. Who can regain for us defeat over death. And who can regain for us a new world and a new heaven. And so we see in verse 2, an angel calling out. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book? And to break its seals. The angel cries out in heaven. Who can redeem mankind's lost inheritance? Who is able? Who is qualified? Who is worthy? Who is suitable? Who can be our kinsman redeemer? And verse 3 says. And no one in heaven. Or on the earth. Or under the earth. Was able to open the book. Or to look into it. No one was found worthy to redeem our forfeited inheritance. No one in heaven, not of all the angels of heaven, not all the saints that had gone to heaven, not Moses, not Elijah, not Abraham, not King David, none of those in heaven were considered worthy to do so. The earth was searched for someone who would be worthy, and no one was found. No one was found under the earth who would be worthy to redeem our forfeited inheritance. And so verse 4 says, And John began to weep greatly, because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. John realizes, if no one can redeem our forfeited inheritance, then mankind is forever doomed to spend eternity in separation from God. John realizes, if no one is found who can be our kinsman redeemer, then we will be doomed forever in hell. And because of that, he begins to cry. The word in the Greek means to wail greatly. I mean, he is really crying loudly. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't I? If we were seeing that scene in heaven and realized that our eternal 
destiny rest in that scroll and it being redeemed and yet all of heaven and all of earth and beneath the earth were searched and no one, not anyone was found worthy to redeem it? Realizing that that meant you and I must forever be separated from God in the agonies and the flames of hell. John's tears represent the tears of all of God's people throughout the centuries. The tears of Adam and Eve as they saw their son Abel killed because of the hatred and jealousy of another son. Those tears of John represent the tears of Israel and their bondage to Egypt. The tears of God's people who have stood beside graves of loved ones whom the wicked world has inflicted with disease and pain and death. John wept because there was no kinsman redeemer found. And because of that he knew creation would remain forever in Satan's grip. And there John is weeping. And suddenly the angel says, Stop weeping, John. There is one. Who is worthy? Verse 5. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Stop weeping, John. There is one who is able to be a kinsman redeemer. There is one who is able to reclaim our lost inheritance. Behold the line that is from the tribe of Judah. And the root of David has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. Who is he referring to? That one Call the line of the tribe of Judah. That's a reference to Genesis 49, where we see the scripture says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. In other words, there is one who would come from the tribe of Judah, who would be a ruler and a king. He says, Look, John, there is one. And he's called the root of David. And again, a reference to Isaiah chapter 11, which says, Then a shoot will spring up from the root of Jesse, that's David's father, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. That says that David's family, like a tree fallen from its roots, would spring up a kingly rule once again to restore the rule of the King David and his family. Who is this one, this line of the tribe of Judah, this root of David? None other than Jesus Christ himself. And notice what he says. He says the root of David has overcome. Make no mistake, the scripture is clear. Jesus Christ has overcome the enemy. Hebrews 2.14 says that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Powerless, folks. The devil is powerless. It goes on in Colossians 2 to say, When he, Christ, had disarmed the rulers and authorities, and is speaking of spiritual rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through the cross. And John says, Jesus speaking, In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Our kinsman, redeemer, Jesus, has already overcome. He is able to redeem us. He has defeated Satan and sin and death. Having seen the the sealed scroll, now we turn to the second scene, the slain lamb. The elder tells John, behold, John, look. Look at your kinsman, redeemer. Look at that one who has reclaimed your forfeited inheritance. And John looks. And what does he see? Does he see a majestic king? Attired in royal apparel? Seated on a great throne? Does he see a great warrior? No, look. He sees a slain lamb. The slain lamb of God. Verse 6. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain. We must never forget the price Jesus paid to redeem us. Jesus is pictured here as a sacrificial lamb. There are two words in the Greek language for lamb. One means a grown lamb. The other means a little pet lamb, a baby lamb. And the word for the baby lamb is only used twice in the New Testament. Once when... 
Jesus tells Peter, feed my little lambs. And the other is in this passage. Here Jesus is pictured as a pet baby lamb in the midst of the throne of God and the angels and the living creatures and the elders. You say, why? Why a pet lamb? Because you will remember it was at Passover that not just any lamb was taken and slain and killed for the sins, but it was a firstling of the flock. He was placed in the bosom of the family for four days. Why? So that family would get close to that little baby lamb that their hearts would be knit to that little baby lamb. And then that lamb would be violently taken out of their family and its throat would be cut. It would be slain. And the word used here as a lamb as if slain is the same equivalent to the Old Testament word for the sacrificial lamb being killed and slain. And so John is saying to us clearly, this lamb, Jesus Christ, is a sacrificial lamb. It represents His sacrificial death. It represents His blood cleansing us from all unrighteousness. He's saying that Jesus died as a sacrificial lamb for our sins. He took our place on that cross. He became sin for us. Oh, what love that God demonstrated His love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Through His suffering. Through his obedience, even unto death, he overcame and conquered Satan. And he's pictured as having seven horns. Horns represent power. Seven is the perfect number. It represents his omnipotence. And one who has seven eyes, representing his omniscience. He knows all things. And John says he has redeemed us through his precious blood. He is our kinsman redeemer. He has regained for us eternal life. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He has regained for us victory over death. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, yet though he dies, shall he live. He has reclaimed for us the world. Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place, I'll come again. That where I am there, you may be with me also. He has redeemed us. And he alone is worthy to hold the deed, the title deed of the universe. Verse 7. And he came, that is the lamb. And he took it, that is the scroll. The forfeited inheritance, our forfeited inheritance. He took it out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now, imagine this scene in heaven. Now, imagine it. Here we have the 24 elders representing the Christians, the saints of all ages. Here we have the four living creatures around the throne. Here we have myriads and myriads of angels around the throne. And we see the Father God seated seated on the throne with a scroll of man's forfeited inheritance. The word goes out through all the universe. Is anyone worthy to redeem mankind's forfeited inheritance? And the word comes back, no one is found. And John is just broken and he begins to cry and weep loudly. And then in the midst of his weeping, an elder steps forward and says, John, stop crying. There is one who is found. There is one who is able. And he says, look, the lion of the tribe of Judah the root of David. And John looks and he sees the Lamb of God slain for our sin. And all of heaven waits in silence to see if the Lamb will indeed take that scroll, that forfeited inheritance. When he takes it symbolizing indeed he has redeemed our inheritance. And they wait and the Lamb reaches and takes from the Father the scroll of our forfeited inheritance symbolizing indeed he has redeemed us. And when that happens, folks, let me tell you, all of heaven breaks loose in one hallelujah shouting time. Boy, they break loose in a worship and shouting time. Look, look what happens. And when he, verse 8, had taken the book, the living creatures, and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, having each one a harp 
and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy art thou to take the book and to break its seals. For thou wast slain and did purchase for God with thy blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And thou hast made them to be a kingdom and priest to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. These elders sing the song of redemption. They sing about the price of redemption. For thou wast slain and did purchase with thy own blood. Our redemption cost our Lord dearly. They sing about the power of redemption that men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation have been purchased. That is our assurance that God will save people from every tribe and every tongue and every nation on this earth. If there ever was a verse to encourage missions, that's it. We have assurance that God is in the saving business, the power of redemption. And look at the prize of redemption. Thou hast made them, those whom he has redeemed, to be a kingdom and priest to God. And we will reign upon the earth. We are destined to share the throne with the Lord Jesus. We shall reign upon the earth. <clears throat> now when the elders and the living creatures get through singing this song of redemption, let me tell you, the angels get so excited they cannot contain themselves and they break out into one hallelujah shout. And I looked, verse 11, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was myriads of myriads. That means innumerable. And thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice. And in the Greek, it's mega voice. I mean, they were shouting, worthy is a lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing." And when they get through shouting this, every created thing in the universe gets so caught up in it, they break out in one hallelujah shout and praise to God. And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Now, folks, they realized, they saw, they got a glimpse of the preciousness of redemption. And they got so caught up in it, they could not contain themselves. They had to break out into hallelujah shouting and worshipping before God. Now, I just had all the fun. I got to do the shouting. You didn't get to do any. Amen. Let me ask you a question. If it's right for heaven, is it right for West Side? Huh? Is it? Whew. If there's shouting going on in heaven, do you think it ought to be some shouting going on at West Side? Huh? Amen. Doesn't the scripture say shout unto the Lord? Doesn't it say that? More than one time it says shout unto the Lord. Amen. Psalm 100 says it. You know, some people say, but it's not dignified to shout. Well, what is the definition of dignified? You ever thought about it? The definition of dignified is conduct that is appropriate in the presence of a dignitary, right? Do you know of any dignitary greater than the Lord God Almighty? Huh? Do you know any place more dignified than the throne of God? And I believe if shouting's proper for the throne, it's proper for West Side. Amen? Amen. Whoa. Whoo. Well, I'm going to give you a chance. All right, let's go. Take your Bibles, open them up. Revelation chapter 5. If you don't want to have them opened up, open them up. Loud voice, the scripture says. And while you're looking that up, let me just refer to one place in the Old Testament over in Ezra. Chapter 3. In Ezra 3, they had come back from the exile. And God was sending a mighty revival. And it says, Now when the builders had laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets, 
and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with symbols to praise the Lord according to the directions of King David of Israel. And they sang, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, saying, He is good, for His loving kindness is upon Israel forever. And all the people shouted, it says. All the people shouted with a great shout, when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Yet many of the priests and the Levites and the heads of the father's household, the old men who had seen the first temple, wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, while many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the shout of joy from the sound of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the sound was heard far away. I mean, it traveled. What the world would do if they could hear us shouting praises to God. Amen. All right, let's stand. I'm going to give you a chance to praise God. Amen. Amen. It's proper. Stand up. And if you want to close your eyes, you feel more comfortable, you feel free to do that. But just remember, we want to offer praise worthy, worthy praise. So how worthy is your lamb to be praised? People go to a football game and just shout as loud as they can over a little old ball game. Right? And yet when it comes to praising their God, they're like a wooden Indian. Won't say a word. Now, is that right? Is that proper? Let's join heaven in praising God. I'll re- say the phrase and then you repeat it after me. Or should I say, shout it after me. All right? All right, now let's get, let's get with the Lord. I'll tell you what we'll do. Everybody just close your eyes. That will keep any inhibitions from creeping up. Just close your eyes. This was mainly between you and God. Just close your eyes. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. To receive power and riches. To receive power and riches. And wisdom and might and honor. And wisdom and might and honor. And glory and blessing. And glory and blessing. To him who sits on the throne. And to the Lamb. And to the Lamb. Be blessing and honor and glory. Be blessing and honor and glory. And dominion forever and ever. And dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. That was good, folks, but it wasn't good enough. All right. I don't think that was a praise our Lord deserves. I really don't. All right. Close your eyes again now. Let's really praise God. With a shout. Don't worry about the people in front of you. They can take it. All right? Amen. Before our God. Lord, enable us to lift up worthy praises to you. You are worthy of all praise. Of highest praises. We should have never shouted into about anything more loudly than we shout your praises. We should be as enthusiastic and joyous, more so over praising you than ever. Our voices should be raised louder right now than they've ever been raised in our life. Because you're worthy. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. To receive power and riches and wisdom. And might and honor and glory. And might and honor and glory. And blessing. And blessing. To him who sits on the throne. To him who sits on the throne. And to the Lamb. And to the Lamb. Be blessing and honor and glory. Be blessing and honor and glory. And dominion forever and ever. And dominion forever and ever. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. You may be seated. Amen. As we partake of this Lord's table, 
I want you to reflect on the slain Lamb of God. You may just want to read through this chapter again. This elements are being passed out. Just ask God to give you a deeper manifestation of His presence and a revelation of Jesus than you've ever seen before. What did the elders do? Verse 14, when they saw it, they fell down in worship. Go ask our deacons to come and take their positions on the front as we have a time of examination. Scripture says, before we partake of the Lord's table, we must always examine ourselves. To partake of the Lord's table without examining ourselves is to invite judgment. Church at Corinth, did not examine themselves as a result of it. Some of them were sick. Some had even died. Well, how do you examine yourself? Number one, you ask God if there's any sin in your life that you've not brought before Him. Any sin you're trying to harbor, you're trying to hide, you're trying to say, oh, this isn't a sin. But the Spirit's been dealing with you. Bring it before Him in confession. Bring it to the cross. Secondly, Do you have any unforgiveness in your heart toward anyone else? Do you have any bitterness in your heart? Do you have any resentment in your heart toward anyone and you're not willing to let go of it? You're not at least asking God to take it out of your heart? Are you holding on to it? If so, the scripture says you don't partake of the Lord's table until you seek to go and make it right. There may be somebody in this room that you need to go to during this time of examination and ask them to forgive you for something you've done or ask them to forgive you for the anger you've had in your heart or the unforgiveness you've had. People, if we're going to see the power of God, we've got to get serious about our relationship to each other because the unity of the body will cause the power of God's Spirit to flow. Let's spend some time asking the Spirit of God to search us. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. Search us. Reveal to us any sin in our life that needs to be brought before you, Father. Place conviction upon us and give us the spirit of repentance. Show us, Father, if there's any bitterness that we're harboring in our hearts or unforgiveness toward a family member, somebody at work, a friend or acquaintance. Convict us, Holy Spirit. Father, search our hearts and know us and try us and test us. Show us if there's any sinful way within us that we might come before you in confession and repentance.